Um, hi, everybody. Hope you're having a great evening. So far, I'm having a great evening. I see Gregory Mallard has joined. Hi, Greg. Thanks for coming. Russ Gallman. Hi, Russell. How are you? Um, um, How did you enjoy the MMT conference? I'm sure a lot of it was a blast. Hi, Randy Hedgebeth. Great to see you. And Jill Stevens, welcome to you. Hope you're doing well tonight. I'll be starting in just a second or two. How's my sound, by the way? Can you hear me well? Please let me know. According to my indicators here, everything is fine. Oh, thank you, Greg. That's welcome and very nice to know. So tonight, I want to begin with, 
by discussing an article from Counterpunch called The Case for Impeachment Goes Far Beyond the Ukraine. That's a few days old now. It was published on J September 27th, 2019. It was written by Peter Serto. I'm going to go over it now as soon as I share the page with you. There it is. I see the page on my monitor. You should be able to see it soon. Yeah, when I was looking over the program of the conference, I thought that uh, day three uh, was likely to uh, to be the best. I'm sorry, day two okay, was likely to be the best, and I think it was. I thought there were two outstanding panels. Okay, on day two, I have to fix what my screen is showing. It'll be fixed as soon as I go back to the article. <laughs> okay, you should be seeing it now. Let me blow up the text a little bit for you. Uh, that should be a tad better. Okay, so um, Peter Serto starts off with, has Trump finally gone too far? There's a headline you've seen, <laughs> there's a headline you've seen a thousand times. He says, at last, Speaker Pelosi says he has. The whistleblower says Trump withheld foreign aid to the Ukraine. Or to Ukraine, I should say. There's no you, uh, there's no the in front of the Ukraine. They object to that. To pressure the country's new president into investigating Joe Biden's son Hunter's past business there. Trump doesn't even really deny it. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi has long resisted calls for impeachment to the chagrin of more progressive lawmakers and activists. But the latest revelations finally brought a cavalcade of more centrist party figures around on the issue. If true, of course, Trump's conduct was um, patently corrupt. Quote, the president uses his office to get a foreign government to investigate a political rival with an eye towards undermining that rival. That's a clear abuse of power that assaults the basic premises of American democracy, explains John Nichols in The Nation, unquote. But I admit I'm puzzled, not about why Trump's behavior here was bad, but why this was the offense that got so many reluctant Democrats to stick their neck out. So to my mind, that's the biggest issue surrounding this um, um, impeachment. There was so much else to impeach Trump on. Why impeach him on this issue? And why only on this issue? Why narrow the scope to this issue? Peter Serto goes on, there's been any number of earlier abuses from the merely venal, like altering a hurricane forecast with a sharpie, to the unapologetically corrupt, like uh, putting military officers in Trump hotels and charging taxpayers for vacations <laughs> at his own properties. <laughs> that is, when he takes vacations and goes to his own properties, he charges taxpayers. Remember the emoluments clause of the Constitution. 
president cannot profit from his dealings while in office. I also recall there was something about Russia, a fired FBI director, and oh right, that time he called the Nazis who just beaten people and killed someone in Charlottesville, quote, very fine people, unquote. At every juncture, and countless others, the pundits wondered whether this was the last straw, only to have a fresh truckload, <laughs> a fresh uh, truckload of something, um, actually delivered uh, the next day. Or maybe he meant a truckload of straw. <laughs> In fact, the Trump campaign now makes a killing selling Trump-branded plastic straws to trigger the sea turtles, I guess, says Serto. To me, the Ukraine-Biden gambit looks like a lot of other things Trump has accustomed us to expect from him. Is there some deep reservoir of public affection for Biden um, or Ukraine that uh, the Democrats feel they can draw on to get their case, case across this time? It seems unlikely. The fact that we've grown desensitized to such abuses could itself be the best reason to finally prosecute one. But truthfully, there are about a thousand other things I'd rather see lawmakers build a case around. For instance, after taking buckets of fossil fuel money and after appointing fossil fuel executives to his cabinet, the president rolled back power plant emissions limits launched legal action against automakers to agree to increase their fuel efficiency and wants us out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, I thought he's already taken us out of the Paris Climate Agreement, hasn't he? He's repeatedly censored government climate scientists to cover his tracks. Serto asks, is destroying the climate impeachable? What about caging thousands of children or continuing to separate them from their parents after a court ordered him to stop or openly violating U.S. and international law on the treatment of uh, refugees? or allegedly encouraging border officials to break the law with the promise of a pardons. Speaking of attacking rivals, what about tweeting incendiary racist slanders against uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the representatives Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and other progressive women of color? all but openly encouraging extremist uh, violence uh, against them. What about encouraging a foreign leader, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin um, 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 Netanyahu to block those members of Congress from an official visit to the top uh, U.S. aid uh, recipient, which of course okay, is Israel. Impeachment is as much a political tool as a legal one. If Democrats feel they need the Ukraine story as a legal hook to start the process, that's one thing. But I hope they won't forget to make a political case against these much more egregious, egregious abuses along the way. Otherwise, they risk sending the message that the worst thing a president can do isn't to attack the people or the climate, but a fellow elite. Yes, that's the message the Democrats are sending right now. If they hope to have these impeachment uh, proceedings, put any pressure on the Senate and also benefit their upcoming campaign. Um, in politics. They have to broaden their political case. They can never forget 
that impeachment is only a quasi-legal proceeding. It is primarily a political proceeding. The action of removing a president from office is a political action. That doesn't mean it's necessarily partisan, but it does mean it's a political action taken by a political branch, an unambiguously political branch of the government, the Congress, the legislative branch of the government. The power to remove a president was not pay, placed in the hands of the court. It was placed in the hands of the political branches of government specifically the House and the Senate, the Congress. That's what the framers did, and that's the way it remains until today. There has never been a successful impeachment in the United States in the sense that the impeachment of a president was followed by a conviction. There have been two impeachments so far. The first was of Andrew Johnson, but Andrew Johnson was never convicted in the Senate. I believe the date of the impeachment, if I recall correctly, was 1867. It may have been a bit um, um, earlier than that. The second situation of impeachment was never an impeachment that came to a conclusion. Uh, that is, the president, specifically Richard Nixon, in 1974, was about to be impeached um, by the House with considerable bipartisan support. When the Republicans in the Senate saw this, they sent a delegation to the Senate, and they said to Nixon, you cannot survive this impeachment because there's considerable bipartisan support in the Senate to sustain the effort to get 67 votes in the Senate and convict uh, you there. They said, please spare the country the agony of this and resign. And Nixon did. And he was pardoned by Gerald Ford at a later time. But if there was a corrupt deal at the time that offer him a pardon if he was go if he would go, I cannot say. But in the event that is what happened. To save the country grief he did receive a pardon from, uh, from Ford, but for the rest of his life, he was pretty much a political pariah. The third impeachment, of course, was Bill Clinton in 1999, if I recall correctly. Maybe it was in 98, I forget. But Mr. Clinton, a popular president, was impeached for lying to uh, the Congress, for lying um, under oath. He was accused of having an affair while in the White House. 
he lied about it um, 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 under oath to the Congress. He was impeached by the House. But the votes were not there in the Senate to impeach him. He continued to be a popular president all through this period and all through the rest of his term. And he's been a pretty central figure in politics since that time, certainly in the 10 years following uh, the presidency okay, of Clinton. It's arguably the case that he was popular enough that if Al Gore had run more on Clinton's record, that he might have been successful in winning the presidency uh, 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 in the year 2000. It's very much true, though that the impeachment effort by the Republicans did not harm them, as far as we can tell, in the election of 2000. So, with that, I will leave this first article. And bring up a second article. Which is aptly titled... Impeach all the presidents. And this was an article written by the historian um, whose name is uh, by Danny Jerson or Jerson, and he is a retired military and reached the rank okay of major and i believe he has a phd in history and he writes good history and good columns and he has some very interesting to say things to say in this article which appeared in uh, truth day on September 30th. Well, that's today, isn't it? <laughs> Let me clear out some of the chaff here so you can see the wheat. Let me make sure I still got that. I still do have it. And Danny Gerson says, sorry, liberals, but Nancy Pelosi's newly announced impeachment inquiry will not end Donald Trump's um, but, um, but, um, um, presidency, uh, but prematurely, no matter how badly Democratic voters may want it. Even if he's found guilty in the House, well, of course, he can't be found guilty in the House. What the House can do is to indict him, actually up to the Senate to find him guilty or not guilty. Anyway, if he's found guilty in the House, the Republican-controlled Senate is sure to deny Pelosi the requisite 67 votes that are needed to remove him from office. Well, there's disagreement about that. There are some Republican campaign consultants who believe that there are already 30 to 35 votes uh, in the Senate uh, um, to remove him. Well, specifically, what they claimed was that if a secret ballot were held in the Senate uh, today, that there would be 67 votes that would be needed to remove him uh, from office. And then he says, maybe that isn't such a bad thing either. After all, evicting Trump would elevate a bona fide Christian fascist to commander-in-chief in the person of Mike Pence. Yes, it would. But he wouldn't be president for long. He doesn't have the same popularity with the fascist base 
that uh, Donald Trump has. So maybe that would not be such a bad um, substitution. Besides, there's been talk of impeaching Pence too. Anyway, to go on, don't get me wrong. It's not that Trump doesn't serve to be, doesn't um, actually deserve to be kicked out of office. He's run this country like he'd run a nepotistic crime family, a corrupt Atlantic City casino, or some combination of the two. The latest Ukraine scandal is indeed a serious matter. In fact, early polls suggest plenty of Americans support impeachment, and there is value in creating a public record of Trump's abuses. It's just that one. It's far more palatable and strategic to beat Trump at the ballot box. And two, the real presidential abuses of power are systemic and not unique to the former reality show host. What's more, Democrats' efforts to impeach could well end up actually backfiring, handing Trump an undeserved second term. Let's start with the last point. Recent history, both at home and abroad, suggests that when an opposition party, uh, when an opposition party adopts, quote, impeach the bastard as its uh, the primary political message, the hated leader tends to benefit uh, at the polls. The slapstick Monica Lewinsky charade into which Republicans threw all their energy in the late 1990s, to offer one example, ended up actually bolstering Bill Clinton's uh, popularity. Now, to cite uh, this as an example is questionable. The reason why was because Clinton was a very popular president at the time that people thought was really doing uh, a great job in the presidency. Uh, his approval rating was high, and people liked Bill Clinton. Okay, besides, on the other hand, uh, but Trump's popularity rating, especially at this phase of his uh, time in the presidency, is fairly low, and people do not think he's been doing a good job, and they object to many of his policies and even among those who support him, a lot of them, even though they say they approve of his policies, they personally dislike him and find his conduct to be reprehensible. So Trump is a different example. And in addition, it's not uh, that Trump is lying about Uh, act, uh, having um, 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 having a marital affair about um, um, somebody. What he's doing currently is lying about trying to hush it up by paying money to settle with two of the ladies that he had affairs with. In other words, he tried to shut them up by paying them off so he could be elected to the presidency. That is a much more serious offense than the Monica Lewinsky um, situation was. So what we have is a more serious offense than the Monica Lewinsky offense. And uh, we also have an attempt to influence a foreign government to the advantage of the president in his upcoming run in the presidency, which is against the Constitution and law to do. And so the case is much different, actually, than the Lewinsky case. And the president is much less popular. And this argues for the possible 
success of the opposition party in the Congress, in the House that they control. Okay. More recently, okay, in Italy, the Partito Democratico um, um, actually failed miserably in its efforts to evict uh, the buffoonish populist um, Silvio Berlusconi. While it eventually drove him from office, it never defeated him at the ballot box. What's worse, uh, Mr. Berlusconi has been succeeded by a slew of authoritarians who mimic many of his worst qualities. Do Democrats really want to empower the next, perhaps even uglier manifestation of the Trump uh, monster? Make no mistake, Trump voters won't take impeachment lying down. In 2016, the then Republican candidate for president wasn't kidding or wrong when he said his supporters would stick with him even if he murdered someone in broad daylight in New York City. An impeachment, quote, end run, unquote, that fails to achieve its um, desired aim could make Democrats look not just weak but desperate, unwilling to engage with the real issues of the 2020 election, um, um, health care, reparations, taxes, um, immigration, and so forth. You forgot one really big issue here, the Green New Deal. Uh, but yes, it would be a mistake to impeach him on just this one charge alone or on this one issue alone. On the other hand, I really question the idea that uh, the most rabid of Trump supporters would be a danger after the impeachment and the removal of Trump okay, from office. And I also think that his removal from office might well serve to energize the, uh, the Democratic base. Yeah, they're not going to take this um, lying down. Okay, but the Democratic base is not going to take it okay, if the president is not convicted by the Senate. They're not going to take that lying down. So, it doesn't seem to me the situation is as bad as all that, okay, as Major Danny is saying. But he's right that it would harm the Democrats to impeach him on only this one issue. And he goes further. He says more urgent now is that we recognize that neither Trump's alleged interference in the 2020 elections nor his apparent obstruction of justice in the Russiagate investigation ranks among the worst of his offenses. Disturbingly for mainstream liberals, those abuses of power have a long history that also implicate his recent predecessors, including one Barack Obama. Absolutely. It blows my mind that congressional Democrats will draw a red line on uh, Ukraine while virtually ignoring decades of presidential misconduct. Where was Congress when Obama, then Trump, sponsored Saudi Arabia's war crimes um, in Yemen? By the way, everybody, there's no question that they are uh, war crimes um, in Yemen. Uh, both presidents actually provided military assistance to a cause that could not have proceeded without it. And both failed to secure the constitutionally mandated approval from the Congress. Danny asks, where was the legislative branch when George W. Bush, then Obama, then Trump twisted the already questionable post 9-11 authorizations for the use of military force of the AUMFs to expand U.S. wars across the, uh, the greater Middle East? that have shattered uh, the region. Or when Bush 
um, um, illegally uh, and perennially detained accused terrorists at Guantanamo Bay, or when Obama assassinated an American citizen in a drone strike without any semblance of due process, or when Trump um, 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 actually militarized the southern border, separated families, stuck kids in cages, and then denied them soap or toothbrushes. Are we to believe that none of these uh, by unilateral and constitutionally prohibited executive actions met the threshold of high crimes and misdemeanors? Give me a break says Danny. And I agree with him entirely about this. Give me a break. Give me a break. There can be a bill of particulars concerning impeachment as long as you're armed. And that list doesn't even begin to cover the violations of the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution. Danny says, most likely, this latest impeachment gambit is too little, far too late, an act of political theater, theater full of sound and fury signifying uh, nothing. Oh, it'll make for great entertainment, thrilling a corporate media that long ago abandoned news for spectacle. But as has become the American way, it will invariably ignore the systemic rot that made Trump's election and the dictatorial actions of recent presidents possible in the first place. So here's my modest proposal for Congress and the American people. If, or more likely when, the former fails to deliver, colon, impeach the military-industrial complex and the venal corporate arms dealers, the, quote, merchants of death, unquote, who profit from worldwide slaughter. Impeach the, quote, revolving door, unquote, generals like Jim Mattis, who slide seamlessly from the military to the boards of the nation's largest defense contracting firms, impeach the militarized police forces and mass incarceration structure that transform impoverished black and brown communities into occupied um, enemy territory. Impeach yourselves, Congress, for being asleep at the wheel for decades now, for wallowing in tribal stalemate and eschewing your constitutionally mandated duty to declare and oversee this nation's wars. Impeach the whole damn system of American empire, both at, ho both at home and abroad. And even though I don't precisely understand what he means by impeach here, I think he means stop all these activities and remove those in Congress who support them in whatever way is available to us. And he says, as I close, I'd be remiss if I didn't disclose the genesis for this article's title. Ryan Keene, a friend, former soldier, poet, and fellow member of the anti-war group, About Face, Veterans Against the War, exchanged frustrated texts with me following the Pelosi impeachment announcement. Quote, it won't work, unquote, he wrote. It will make a Democrats, quote, look impulsive, unquote. He later added that impeachment is, quote, a charade. They won't, they know, won't come to fruition, um, unquote. They do look um, impulsive. That's right. The reason why they look um, impulsive is because of all the serious abuses of power Trump had engaged in before now, which did not move them to impeach. But this one, where he tried to interfere with um, 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 the elections by getting information from a foreign power about arrival. This does look um, impulsive. It looks like he finally stepped across a line, which to most of us 
seems a much more trivial line than all his other abuses. Ryan served in the U.S. Army uh, uh, in Iraq, says Danny, as a prison guard at Camp Cropper for some of the high-value detainees uh, the U.S. held there. He observed abuse, torture, and early signs uh, that uh, this nation might just be creating a, quote, terror university in its jails, creating in the process the seedbed, okay, of ISIS. For a decade and a half, Ryan has struggled with a whole range of veterans' mental health crises, from PTSD to depression. He's a self-taught man who relies on his experience in war as the foundation for his activism. Ryan has no advanced degree in international uh, relations, nor did he study political science at a fancy um, a university. But he knows something Pelosi doesn't, something he wrote me the morning after she delivered her address. Quote, the issue isn't the person, it's the system, um, um, unquote. Now, I have to disagree there. I think that actually Pelosi does know that is the issue. But she doesn't want to take up the issue because she likes the system as it is, because it provides donor money to the campaigns of all the Democrats. It provides the corruption they are thriving on. And in some ways, she likes that. She might want to end much of that while um, 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 not ending the practice of donors buying politicians. But that is an impossibility. And that's why, that's why she's not actually taking up the system. In fact, it's arguably the case that when some of the more progressive of the Democrats' Congress people wanted to go for a wide range of particulars, she allowed the rightest Congress people to persuade her to limit the impeachment inquiry at this time to the single issue of what was going on with uh, Ukraine. We know she did that. We don't know exactly why. Some people attribute it to the influence of these relatively few Congress people. But I attribute it to Nancy Pelosi herself because she could have pushed on those Congress people. She could have threatened with them. She could have threatened them with all the tools at her disposal to get them to go along with a broad bill okay, of inquiry. But she did not do that. And the reason why she didn't is that she's against fundamental change um, in the system. While Ryan, um, but also Major Danny, both of them know that there's something rotten in the state of Denmark. Not in Denmark, of course. And that that something, the system itself, has to be fixed. I thought that title, by the way, was great. Impeach all the presidents. We move now to the issue of saving our planet and what is necessary to save our planet. An article appeared in Truth that protest alone won't save our planet. It appeared on September 27th.
and it was written by, sorry, I clicked that too soon. It was written by Paul Street, one of the primary contributors to Truth Dig. And a very excellent writer, in my view. So Paul says, we can all use a shot of hope. I got one from 16-year-old Swedish activist, um, Greta Thunberg, and the disproportionately youthful masses. Four million across 150 cities worldwide who came out for climate sanity last week. I listened online to the speech Thunberg uh, gave to more than 300,000 mostly young people in Low Manhattan on Friday. When was the last time there was, by the way, a protest in Lower Manhattan numbering 300,000 people? I think that's an extremely big protest, even for that particular borough of New York City. She spoke um, eloquently, to return to the article, about the supreme um, ecological danger we face, thanks to the relentless pursuit of profit and to the insincere assurances and pathetic inaction of politicians and policymakers the world over. And here's a quote from Greta. We have not taken to the streets, sacrificing our education for the audit, the adults and politicians to take selfies with us and to tell us that they really, really, really admire what we do. We're doing this to wake the leaders up. We're doing this to get them to act. We deserve a safe future. Is that really too much to ask? We will hold those who are most responsible for this crisis accountable, and we will make the world leaders act. Why should we study for a future that is being taken away from us, that is being sold for profit? Everywhere I have been, the situation is more or less the same. The people in power, their beautiful words are the same. The empty promises are the same. The lies are the same, and the inaction is the same, unquote. Toonberry inspired me to walk out of my Chicago apartment building and make my way to the student climate strike at the Loop. There I beheld a vast procession of mostly young people, including high school and even grade school students, chanting and holding up signs with pithy slogans, expressing a passionate desire to keep the planet safe for humans and other living beings. The young people's chants and cheers drowned out the war of the L trains above. I got in the middle of the march, talking to kids, asking them how their teachers felt about their afternoon off school. Now, many were supportive, querying them, not as a journalist looking for a story, but as an old guy Yes, Paul is old by now. Seeking an infusion of hope and energy from people who haven't become as jaded, cynical, and defeated as most of my generational cohorts. It was good to take a cue from the kids to turn off the computer and come out into the streets. When I first came of radical political age in the late 1970s, my fellow late new lefties and I were all about ecology, sensing that humanity was entering a period of environmental crisis. We read Rachel Carson, Edward uh, Abbey, and Barry Commoner, okay, among other clarion voices, telling us that Homo sapiens needed to call off its capital and government led war on a livable planet. Okay, many of us got lost, turning away from the earth that bears ever angrier, angrier witness to our uh, destructive capitalist and industrial ways. I got caught up in the quest for a career and working on important issues that aren't going to matter at all that much if we don't act soon to avert environmental collapse. After all, there's no social justice or democracy on a dead planet. Uh, but this was a mistake. I have to say that I also fell into this trap. I've worked on things that I thought very consequential for my 
um, 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 whole career. Uh, I worked on the environment for a few years too during uh, the 1970s when I worked on a project called uh, the, uh, the Limits to Growth uh, Project. I wrote some things then on it. I followed the environmental issues then. I, inf I f also followed them during the Carter administration. But uh, when Reagan took office and there seemed no chance of change and where there were many other issues to be concerned about, I went on to the other issues and I did not work on the climate issues. I got immersed in research of various kinds. In the 1990s, okay, I got immersed in the knowledge management field. That was becoming an important field in the study, okay, of organizations. And it was possible to earn a living um, actually doing that. Some of what I did uh, within that field is relevant uh, to what, okay, I'm doing today, okay, in a variety of ways. But I didn't get back to politics and therefore to environmental issues, even in a small way, until 2009, 2010. And even then, the climate wasn't the primary issue I was paying attention to. The primary issues were fiscal policy issues and Medicare for all. Uh, the climate issues were taking second place okay, until very recently. And I say with Paul Street, there's no social justice or democracy on a dead planet. This was a mistake. Um, um, I made a mistake. Still, Paul says, I am not utterly devoid of lessons worth passing on to younger people from previous decades of political engagement and observation. One chant that history would not let me join in on Friday channeled popular anger into the nation's empty, savagely time-staggered and corporate uh, but, uh, but, uh, but captive electoral rituals. And politicians take note, the chant went, Quote, students will rise up and vote, unquote. And Paul says, to what end? There has been no greater progressive delusion and no bigger graveyard of social movements in American history than U.S. candidate-centered electoral politics. Voting for a Democrat who sounds like he or she cares about the environment fixes nothing. It can actually make things worse by creating an illusion that one has uh, actually meaningfully advanced hope and change when one has really just hope put deceptive new clothes on the soulless empire of ecocide. Um, candidate Obama claimed he would help stop global warming and thereby make the ocean uh, stop um, um, by rising as president. He stealthily championed fracking and offshore drilling, along with national surveillance and police state that dismantled the Occupy camps and cordoned off, cordoned off the Standing Rock water and uh, uh, by climate uh, protectors. Since leaving office, quote, clean power, unquote, Obama has boasted to oil company executives and managers about his role in boosting so-called American energy independence by expanding domestic U.S. oil and gas production. He was a green president, all right. Green, as in serving those with money and reaping the cash rewards after leaving office. He helped greenwash capital's war on a livable planet, giving it a counterfeit uh, uh, by, uh, sorry, a, a counterfeit 
um, 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 a cover of a progressive kind. I would call it a faux progressive co cover. Now, he tells uh, Toonberry that he and she are, quote, um, 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 are, quote, a team, unquote. President Joe Biden or Elizabeth Warren will not seriously confront climate collapse. Only a Bernie Sanders presidency holds serious promise in that regard. And the carbon invested and addicted corporate and financial powers that be within and beyond the Democratic Party are not going to let such a thing occur. I have one comment on that last uh, paragraph. And that part is, we will never know whether they will allow such a thing to occur unless we all get out there and we elect a much more progressive Congress and we elect Bernie Sanders as the President of the United States. If we vote for him in the numbers, we should. And it still is rigged against him. Then perhaps, and probably, the verdict okay, of uh, Paul Street that they will never let such a thing occur will carry weight. But at this point, it still may be a little premature. Our efforts to stop the rigging will be much more vigorous this time. And if the rigging does occur, it will be even more visible at this time than it was in 2016. And visibility may put an end to it by people overcompensating at uh, the polls. Street goes on and says impeachment also won't get us out of our environmental mess. In fact, in the days since Toonberry's speech in Battery Park, the now distinctly possible coming impeachment of Donald Trump took over the news cycle. The climate issue is Trump yet again in the dominant uh, um, culture okay, of media and politics of the world's most powerful and environmentally ruinous nation. Even on Friday, the massive student climate pro protests were not mentioned until 10 minutes into CBS Evening News. The bias and the selection of the news media to bias the national discussion is utterly and absolutely scandalous. Go on with street. Preceded by reports of a bus crash and the New England Patriots firing of its star wide receiver, um, um, Antonio Brown. Those, in other words, were more important than a worldwide protest of 4 million people with 300,000 of them in Manhattan alone, and a massive protest in Chicago, too. But reports of a bus crash and the firing of a football star were more important to the CBS Evening News, okay, to, or to their producers. That station ought to lose its license, along with Fox and uh, NBC and their cable affiliates. They all richly deserve to be, quote, impeached, unquote. The president richly deserves impeachment, says Street. But the Republican-controlled Senate is too afraid of his white nationalist base to remove him. And removing him would only put the Christian fascist Mike Pence in the White House. Uh, gee, uh, you know, it seems to me Major Danny said exactly the same thing, didn't he? <laughs> the notion of impeaching the echo fascist Trump for his most, uh, uh, his most egregious sin, accelerating the project of turning the planet into a giant greenhouse gas chamber, is of course completely off the table. I couldn't agree more there. So, and Major Danny said exactly the same thing. That's the biggest issue. Is there any penalty 
for pursuing a policy of planetary ecocide. Protests are not without uh, limits. They can move one forward on the path to seriously confronting concentrated wealth and power. But they can also serve as pressure-reducing safety valves, providing emotionally potent illusions of popular power and functioning as strange vehicles of incorporation and co-optation. The deadly system marches on without serious disruption of its inner workings. As truth to calmness, Chris uh, uh, um, Hedges reflects, protests, quote, can also be empty political theater, unquote, and, quote again, can be used to distance ourselves from a repugnant political figure such as Donald Trump while leaving us silent and complicit when the same policies are carried out by a supposed progressive such as Barack Obama, unquote. Things get serious when you go beyond protest to resistance. By deciding to use the young free speech activist uh, Mario Savio's words more than a half century ago that, quote, the operation of the machine has become so odious that you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus and make it stop. You've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all, unquote. And Street says, if that time hasn't arrived by now, it never will. The machine, quote, modern, unquote, global and militarized state capitalism has gone far beyond um, um, odious. It is literally exterminist. Never heard that word before, but I think it's really apt, exterminist placing prospects for a decent and organized human existence at terminal risk. Capital and its allies and servants within and beyond governments are pushing us even closer to irreversible environmental tipping points. Quote, you've stolen my dreams and childhood with your empty words, Toonberry told war, uh, world leaders Monday at the UN. Quote, entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal um, economic growth. How dare you, uh, unquote. This is, by the way, um, in the context where uh, some of the modern money theory, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the modern monetary theory people are saying, that we have to measure um, um, our progress instead of in terms of gross um, domestic product, uh, we have to measure it in terms of gross uh, what's the word? It's the the title of the indicator actually escapes me, but it's basically uh, real progress, real prosperity, uh, real sustainability. Uh, it was embodied in the MMT conference in a talk uh, uh, um, um, that was given by Fadl um, Kaboob, I believe, uh, on the morning of the second day. Poignant and heartbreaking words, truthful words, but the grim rulers are not moved. The audacity of their cynicism is boundless. Their corporations and financial institutions are pathological pathological by design. Speaking truth to power is a waste of time. It is dysfunctional. It isn't about waking up our so-called leaders. 
whatever their varying subjective standpoints. Um, Money Mad Master's uh, objective position renders them annihilationist and thus evil. The world capitalist system depends on constant and relentless growth. No, I'm sorry, gross domestic uh, happiness, I think, is the indicator. And relentless growth, the endless uh, pillaging and commodification of the earth to sustain their holy rate of profit. The idea, okay, of accumulation is the reigning investor class god. The rulers can no more break free from its addictive power than Ahab could break free from his compulsion to uh, slay Moby Dick. If uh, humanity must become the Pequod, capital says, so be it. Ecocide is a capital crime. Power must be shifted from the national and global directorate of money to the popular and natural comments, says Street. The owners won't give it up of their own accord. It will have to be taken from them. We will rebel radically, deeply, and widely, and over a, a sustained period of time, or we will pass from the earth, killed off by our failure to confront class rule. It isn't contra savio, just about showing quote, the people who run and own the machine, unquote, that you want to be free. It's about achieving freedom by dismantling the class rule machine and replacing it with a new democrat and social environmental order, a new set of social relations working within and for, not against the web of uh, life. And so I think, okay, uh, that you'll agree with me that that was a great post. And it, what it advocates for, which is going beyond uh, protest, going beyond speaking truth to power in this way, to direct action of, a, of a various kinds, is likely to be necessary to end this. I don't agree, however, that voting in the upcoming election will necessarily be a futile process. I think we still can make um, a great progress by voting the right people into Congress and the, uh, the presidency of the United States. For the presidency, that means Bernie Sanders is the only one who will cause great structural change uh, to the system. So now I want to get on to a final article dealing with uh, trade. But this relates to the environment also, as I'll make clear as I go through the article. Okay, it raises an issue which has been absent from this campaign uh, for the most part. The issue is What about the corporate tribunals that are in all our trade treaties at this point? Title of the article, which was published originally in Truth Out, I believe in Truth Out. Will 2020 presidential candidates take on corporate um, tribunals? The article was published on September 24th, 2019, and it was written, uh, okay, uh, it was written by Michael Gallant uh, for Truth Out. Let me make the type a little bit uh, larger for you. 
And let me blank out uh, the non-essentials here. Nice picture of the debate stage. When the Democratic presidential candidates take the debate stage this October, they almost surely face a question on trade. The question will be a routine one, yeah, because from the mainstream press, it'll probably be a routine one. It will be about cutting tariffs or the trade war with China. There is one question that will almost certainly not be asked, but perhaps we can influence this if we lobby strong enough for asking the question. Okay. And the author says, though it is a question that demands answers, why have only three current candidates, who are, by the way, Gabbard and Warren and Bernie Sanders, of course, taken a stand against a trade policy that allows corporations to sue foreign governments uh, for regulating them. And what causes this to happen is the presence in the trade treaties of a clause providing investor state dispute uh, settlement. In 2013, the highest court in Ecuador found Chevron Corporation responsible for decades of handling Tox, of mishandling toxic, toxic waste, causing extensive pollution of the Amazon rainforest and poisoning the water supplies of tens of thousands of indigenous inhabitants. Rather than pay the damages, the U.S. oil company sued, not through Ecuador's justice system, but through an opaque parallel system, in other words, not completely, transparent parallel system accessible only to corporations in which by the way states are always the defendants chevron won in a move widely condemned by indigenous leaders and environmental groups a tribunal of three corporate lawyers with questionable incentives the incentives were questionable because the corporate lawyers, okay, um, are lawyers who also represent corporations, not necessarily Chevron in this case, but they serve as judges in these courts as well as lawyers in these courts. So a person will go from being a lawyer uh, defending, I'm sorry, uh, actually prosecuting or pursuing a corporation's case against the government in one case to being a judge in some other case. So the point is the incentives that are there for the corporations is, or for the lawyers is, that if they decide on things in a favorable way for corporations when they're acting as judges, then, of course, they're more likely to be appointed as lawyers for the corporations in other cases and to earn very big fees for doing so. So, three corporate lawyers with questionable incentives overturned uh, the decision of Ecuador sovereign courts. And by the way, they didn't just overturn the decision, okay? In overturning the decision... They cost the nation of Ecuador uh, $3 billion. Now, $3 billion may not sound like a huge amount to someone whose nation is operating with a budget of $5 trillion. But given the population okay, of Ecuador, that... A uh, $3 billion penalty that they incurred was roughly the equivalent of 
a $300 billion penalty uh, that would have been assessed by one of the ISDS courts okay, against the United States. Now, that has never happened yet with respect to the ISDS system, but it could happen. And the thing for you to consider is if one of these courts finds a $300 billion penalty against the United States, what will happen in Congress when suddenly the U.S. has to come up with an additional uh, $300 billion that has not been budgeted for? Will Congress people take that as an excuse to cut Social Security or Medicare or some other vital programs for people in this country? Going on with the article. This is the Investor State Dispute Settlement System, ISDS, built into many trade and investment agreements. Most of ours, we've been concluding agreements like that since the 1970s now. They were started under the Nixon administration. ISDS empowers corporations to sue governments for actions that hurt their expected profits, including even legitimate environmental labor and consumer protection regulations made in the public interest. Earlier this year, more than 200 European organizations joined together to launch an alliance with two demands. No. ISDS in new and replacement trade deals and the removal of ISDS in existing investment deals. In the United States, we must fight for the same. We must. It is long overdue that we fight um, for the same. Now, I've written two ebooks on this. One on the fight to defeat the TPP, which of course contained one of these um, um, ISDS clauses, and I chronicled that fight um, um, in Congress and argued in detail against the uh, the ISDS clauses. Um, 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 argued that they in fact were unconstitutional and should be overturned by the courts. Okay. I also argued they were a danger to monetary sovereignty. And of course you see they're a danger to legislative sovereignty okay, as well. And I also argued and showed how to get around them. That was in the first book. In the second ebook, okay, I pointed out that both United States domestic policy and United States trade and foreign policy should be based on the overall criterion of legislating for the public purpose, and that both our foreign policies and our domestic policies should be evaluated on the basis of how they contribute to the public purpose. Now, the ISDS clauses do not contribute to the public purpose. What they do is protect the profits of American companies in foreign countries. American companies who have chosen to invest in foreign countries to make a profit rather than invest here to make a profit. But they've chosen to invest in foreign countries and instead of taking the risks that should adhere in such investments, they have lobbied our government to protect them from such risks by signing these um, ISDS uh, clauses which then are used by companies such as uh, Chevron, okay, in order to get big settlements from states that have tried to regulate them or have fined them for activities. In the case of Ecuador, for the environmental destruction that they engaged in. Now, you would think 
that would be within the legislative power of any nation to do, and that there would be no higher court than that other than the courts of that particular nation. But not when the nation has signed an ISDS clause. And nations dealing with the United States from the 1970s were pretty much required to sign these ISDS clause, clauses, not for the public purpose, but to favor American multinational corporations that wanted to invest in other nations. Uh, so, Michael Gallant says, ISDS mechanisms has existed in some form since the 1950s, but it was not until uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rapid spread of trade agreements in the 1990s that ISDS became a frequent tool of corporate power. From a total of 50 cases in 30 years, ISDS use has mushroomed to well over 50 cases per year since 2011. I earlier said the treaties began under Nixon in the um, 1970s. I think that's correct uh, when we're talking about uh, the specific idea of an ISDS clause as it currently uh, exists. Uh, the author here may be right, he says, have existed in some form, that they might have been originally negotiated uh, in another not so damaging form um, since the 1950s. But uh, the damaging form started to be negotiated in bilateral agreements okay, the United States made with other uh, the nations during the 1970s. And I believe the Nixon administration actually started it. But it was done in the Carter administration. It's done in the Ford administration. Okay, it uh, was done in the Reagan administration. It was done in the Bush administration. And it really started accelerating under Bill Clinton with NAFTA. Now, of course, the actual negotiation of NAFTA took place under Bush, but the pushing of the trade agreement took place um, 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 under Clinton. Okay, now notice, from the standpoint of U.S. law, these trade agreements these trade agreements are not actually treaties. They are what's called executive um, congressional agreements. They're passed by both houses of Congress by majority vote. And they're preceded by the president actually making an executive agreement. And then they're submitted to Congress for a ratification. That's the way um, 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 it works. Okay. Actual trade treaties involve confirmation by two-thirds of the Senate. Now, that was too difficult a standard for these particular trade agreements, too difficult a standard for NAFTA. So the executive branch with Bush and Clinton short-circuited that so that it wouldn't become a trade agreement. Now, it's virtually preceded as though it were a trade treaty. But since it's not a treaty, it can now be taken back by the Congress very easily. All these trade agreements, the congressional executive agreements, can be overturned by legislative authority. 
well, by a combination of executive okay, and legislative authority. Treaties are much more binding. A Bernie Sanders administration could very quickly could very quickly abandon all these congressional executive agreements with the collaborating Congress. If he gets the Congress he needs, we could be out of these clauses in all our trade agreements in a very, very short time. Anyway, going on with the article. From a total of 50 cases in 30 years, ISDS use has mushroomed to well over 50 cases per year since 2011, part of a larger trend of free market fundamentalist globalization that has been widely condemned now even by mainstream economists as having primarily benefited corporations and the wealthy few at the expense of the many. ISDS is no exception. Using ISDS, investors have attacked policies on health, suing Australia for requiring plain rather than brandage packaging of cigarettes, labor, suing Egypt for an increase in uh, uh, the, uh, the minimum wage, financial stability, suing Argentina for interventions taken to stem inflation during its 2001 uh, economic crisis and environment suing Canada for regulating fracking and Germany for delaying permits for coal-fired electric plants. These cases, with serious implications for national welfare, are decided by unaccountable tribunals of corporate lawyers, violating consensus standards of judicial impartiality. Arbitrators do not have security of tenure, are hired and paid for on a per-case basis, and most egregiously are free to rotate between acting as arbitra arbitrators and as counsel for clients. All that is serious, but the most serious violation of this, at least as a congressional executive agreement, is that these agreements are unconstitutional because they make these courts the final authority in judging the actions of the multinational corporations here. Why it's unconstitutional is because our Article Three courts of the Constitution, supervised by the Supreme Court of the United States, are the highest constitutional authority in the United States. when it comes to judicial authority. If the Supreme Court were to rule against one of these multinational corporations, the corporations could take the case to an ISDS court and get a judgment in their favor that according to these treaties would supersede the judgment of the Supreme Court. Now, that scenario is unconstitutional, if it ever happened. That, if then the United States were to contest that on grounds that the trade agreement was unconstitutional in the first place, our judiciary would in that case be constrained to find that unconstitutional or it would be giving up its authority as the supreme judicial authority in the United States. First, uh, ah, ISDS proponents claim the system is fair, citing the statistic that countries win more often than investors. This is to me um, irrelevant, but uh, what Galan says that this is simplistic. First, many cases are settled out of court, often resulting in hefty fees and the rollback of uh, 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 the rollback of 
of the regulations. Second, the majority of country wins are jurisdictional based on initial question of whether or not the case can be tried. Once a corporation clears this hurdle and the courts uh, the ISDS courts say the case can be tried. The statistics reverse. Most importantly, only corporations can sue under the ISDS. Countries can never hope to win, therefore, only not to lose. Even then, legal expenses average over $8 million per case. Facing such courts, governments are often frightened out of policy making altogether. A well-documented effect known as, quote, um, um, by, um, by, um, by, as, uh, um, by, uh, regulatory chilling, unquote. Excuse me while I get some wine here. <laughs> In theory, these courts are meant to be balanced by benefits. ISDS is meant to promote foreign investment by offering investors protection from unexpected policy change. The problem? The problem is that they offer investors protection from unexpected policy change. That's the problem. That's a risk that should be borne by the corporation itself. But our author says here, and he, he's right about this, but it's worse than this. There's little evidence that it works to the extent that investors do require protections. There are plenty of less harmful alternatives, such as domestic court systems, private risk insurance, and state-to-state -state, um, um, arbitration. ISDS subordinates the public interest to the profits of foreign investors. It subordinates the sovereignty of nations to the profits of foreign investors. And not even to the profits, to the potential profits. That's what's written into the ISDS clause. Now, however, some countries are fighting back. In 2016, El Salvador won an ISDS case against the mining corporation whose operations threatened the health and environment of local communities. As a result of an international solidarity campaign, El Salvador amended its investment law to prevent recourse to international tribunals and even imposed a blanket ban on metallic mining. South Africa, Indonesia, India, and others have similarly begun to renegotiate their trade and investment agreements to rid themselves of the ISDS yoke and just recently, it was revealed that uh, the negotiators for what will be the world's largest free trade agreement, uh, that's the new TPP, have taken ISDS completely off the table. Except that Trump is seeking to uh, import part of it into other clauses. In other words, under certain conditions, he might enter into something like the TPP, and those conditions involve, in part, safeguarding the interests okay, of investors, like his cronies. Uh, the United States must do its part to support the, this struggle. I completely agree with that. Then he goes to the presidential campaign and he points out that um, Tulsi and Bernie and Warren have stated opposition to the ISDS. Uh, Gabbard, he says, has called the policy, quote, deeply flawed, unquote, citing the case of a Canadian fossil fuel company that sued the United States for blocking the Keystone Exile pipeline on environmental grounds. Sanders, a longtime critic of corporate friendly trade agreements, has said that, quote, ISDS undermines democracy and allows multinational corporations to put corporate profits ahead of workers, the environment, public health, and food safety, um, um, unquote. Yes, it does um, undermine um, but democracy because it undermines national sovereignty 
in the first place. During the debates over the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, uh, Warren wrote an op-ed condemning um, ISDS, though primarily in um, 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 uh, though primarily in uh, some uh, nationalistic terms. Quote, if a final TPP agreement includes investor state dispute settlement, unquote, she wrote, quote again, the only winners will be multinational corporations, unquote. Warren, Sanders' former, Sanders, former uh, presidential candidate, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, and others also sent an open letter to the Trump administration urging the removal of ISDS from the North American Free Trade Agreement. Now, the remaining candidates, however, have been largely silent on the issue. I spoke um, um, incorrectly before. What Trump's been trying to do is to get a substitution for the ISDS into the new NAFTA agreement. That's what he's been trying to do. He hasn't um, um, actually entered the TPP negotiations seriously yet, as far as I know. The remaining candidates, however, have been largely silent on the issue. This must change. Leadership from the presidential candidates combined with focused public pressure and the sustained efforts of grassroots organizations can move ISDS out of the shadows and into the spotlight. All politicians must be held to the minimum standard of not selling out workers and the environment uh, to, uh, to multinational um, corporations. The path to an alternative system of trade and investment to a global economy that uh, is going to prioritize people and planet over profits begins by ending the ISDS. Together we can take the first step. And so that's that article. It suggests that what we ought to do is to do whatever protesting we can to get that trade issue raised in the presidential debates so we can hear how some of the other candidates feel about the ISDS. For example, Joe Biden has always been a fan of the ISDS, and Mr. Buttigieg has been a fan of the ISDS. And what does Andrew Yang think about the ISDS? We don't know. And Buttigieg, uh, have I mentioned him already? <laughs> so, uh, Harris, what does she think about the ISDS? She's been silent on that. We don't know. We need to have a count of what the candidates on a debate stage think about uh, the, uh, the ISDS. Okay, so that's it. I took a little bit more time than I wanted to on this. I hope it wasn't um, but too long for you. I guess I'll find out when I get back to... Uh, to Facebook and to see uh, how many of you have been patient with me. Well, I guess a few of you are still here. Dolores has said good night. Sandy Deck has joined. Rich uh, Serber has joined. Russ had to call it a night. See you soon, Russ. Ernest Jones joined, Susan Eldridge joined, Dale Weaver joined, Heather Smith joined. Thank you all for joining. Jimmy Sutherland has joined. Gary Hauk okay, has joined. So thank you all for coming. And Christy Yazdi said, hi, you all. Hi, Christy. And Brian Neil Rosser joined, Crystal Folk joined, Sunday Dascalia joined. 
Hi, Sunday. It's been really good to see you. Uh, um, even briefly. And Dolores joined, of course. Amberly Grigo joined. And she said, hello, my lovelies. And Gregory Mallard said, uh, I sent my U.S. senators and congressmen an email um, by giving them an ultimatum. I made them choose between we the people or their party. I hope they give you an answer, Greg. Somehow, I'm not sure they will. And Bonnie Firestone joined and uh, Devorah joined. And Christy Yazzi has said, um, hi, all. Greg says, I've been telling everyone that. And Greg also says, uh, Brett uh, Kavanaugh also deserves to be impeached. Not just Kavanaugh. Clarence Thomas uh, lied at his hearings. And I think that, uh, that Sam Alito and Neil Gorsuch okay, have also lied. Uh, I'd say at least four of the current sitting Supreme Court justices actually need to be impeached because they lied in their hearings. Gary Houck has joined, and Jimmy Sutherland has joined. Hedda Smith, I guess I read your names out before. Okay, any late comments that you have? I don't have too many comments yet. Please share, share, share this. Uh, and when it goes up on YouTube, which will be later tonight, please share, like, and subscribe it. And please go to my um, Patreon account. Uh, flash it up there for you uh, right now. There we go. You should be seeing it now. Also, you'll find my two books on trade at uh, josephmfirestone.com. Okay, the title of okay, one book is Who Needs Balanced Trade? Who Needs... Um, 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 who needs a balanced budget? And the book argues against uh, both of these things and argues for a public purpose standard for our trade and foreign policies and our domestic policy. Actually, the title is Who Needs Balanced Trade? Who Needs a Balanced... Uh, 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 who Needs Balanced Budgets? And my second book on trade is called Declarations of Dependence, Trade, Tyranny, Sovereignty, and uh, Democracy. So please go to josephmfirestone.com. When you click on the icons, those will take you to Amazon. These are Kindle books. And you'll be able to buy the books if you decide that you want to. So, oh, and Elizabeth um, of Netherland has joined. Hi, Elizabeth. Great to see you again. Uh, any late comments on this stream? I'll wait a minute or two, but uh, the stream is about to end if you don't have any more comments or questions. And Elizabeth gives me a thumbs up offline. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth.
Any other comments or questions? And thank you for coming. And thank you for sharing. And thank you for watching and for listening. And I'll see you tomorrow night at roughly 9 o'clock um, if the creeks don't rise. I don't know if you've ever heard uh, that expression. <laughs> I think it's a Midwestern expression. The reason why I think so because it, I got it from uh, someone who comes from um, Indiana. And Elizabeth says, I missed it, but we'll listen to the rerun. Thanks, Elizabeth. And Dolores Pierce says, thank you and good night. Thank you and good night, uh, Dolores. And she has zzz on there. The icon zzz. zzz. It's getting sleepy. Okay, later this week, I'll be getting into some of the MMT conference for you. I know that um, um, already. I'm not sure on which day now, but I'll probably be covering at least a couple, maybe three of the panels from the big um, MMT show last Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Okay, so with that, <laughs> yep, God willing, and the creek don't rise. I put that in plural, though. The creeks, the creeks don't rise. <laughs> we have a few creeks here in Ashburn, Virginia, but probably not enough to give us any trouble. <laughs> Sandy gave me a thumbs up, too. Thank you, Sandy. That's uh, Sandy Day. Anyway, I'm in this stream now, so good night to everybody. <laughs>